Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Some of you may remember the beginning of last week's message. We talked about being in a new place for the first time and how we might look around to see how other people are dressed, what they're doing, how they're behaving, so that we might gain some insight into how we can fit in, how we can not be the guy who's standing out like a sore thumb, the young lady who's standing out like a sore thumb. We want to fit in. But you know what? That's not the only reason we look around when we come into a new environment. We also look for clues about who the other people are. What are they doing? Why are they the way they are? And I want to show that with a little illustration this morning. I brought some things. And I want to show you how just a simple change can give us some indication of what's important to the person. So if you see a person wearing a hat like this, this one's a little small. But if you saw a person wearing a hat like this, you might make some assumptions about that person, right? Either they play baseball or they're a fan of whatever team's represented on the hat, right? So just that simple thing on my head gives you some indication of, of who I am and what I value, right? But what if I had this on my head? This tells you a different story, right? You might make some inferences about what kind of work I do for a living, or even what I'm doing at that very moment. Or maybe if you're really on the ball that day, you'll think, hey, there's nothing on my head. Should I be doing something a little different in order to stay safe? <laughs> or what about this one? What, what if you see someone wearing a hat like this? Maybe you're tempted to buy their lunch. Why? This hat tells you something about the person that's wearing it. Or finally, this one. Does anyone know what this one is, first of all? Yeah, some, I thought some people might think it's a police officer hat, but this is a, a United States Air Force hat. So these hats that people put on their head, they don't change the person under the hat. Right? The, the person's the same. They've chosen to put this thing on their head in order to indicate something to the world around them about who they are. And in some cases, they didn't choose. Right? They were told, this is what you're going to wear because this is going to indicate to the world who you are and what you do. And in times past in the military, you could tell where someone fat, fit in the command structure by what was on their hat. Right? The rank would be on the helmet or the hat, depending on the branch of service and the time period in which they served. And so you could tell where they were in terms of authority based on what was on their head. Is that kind of a ridiculous concept now? I mean, look at us. I look around. I can't tell. All of our heads look the same. Well, this morning we're going to be reading a very, very challenging section of Scripture that has to do with what people put on their heads. But before we went there, I want to demonstrate it's not all that terribly different. We're still doing the same thing now, just... We've changed the context so much that it's hard for us to make the connection. So if you have your Bible with you, please turn it to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to look at what people had on their heads and what it meant. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 will be in verses 2 through 16. And let me pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time that you've given us this morning. And I thank you for your word. As I stand here with my Bible open in front of me and my notes... And the thoughts running through my head from the hours of, of work and preparing for this message, I confess that I depend on you utterly to prevent myself from saying something foolish. I need you. Uh, th there are many topics covered in this passage that are hotly debated in our culture, and I ask that you would enable me to only speak truth, only speak from your word, and not wander into my own thoughts or my own uh, delusions. Lord, I want our lives to be based on your truth from your word, and not on opinions. So I ask that you would enable us to understand what we read, to humbly submit to what you teach us, and to obey and honor you in the way that we live our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. The title of the message this morning gives you a hint about where we're headed. It's called Confusing Coverings. Confusing Coverings. One of the commentaries I read in preparing for this message said there are 22 significant exegetical challenges in this passage. And there's not even 22 verses. So there's a lot of material for us to wrestle with. 
Now, one of my early preaching teachers told me that a good sermon will engage three parts of a human being. Their intellect, their emotion, and their will. Right? We want to engage our minds so that we can understand logically what's going on in the passage. We want to engage our emotions to influence what's going to come next, which is a change in the will. All of us want things that we shouldn't want. All of us don't want things that we should want. So when we come to the Bible, there's an expectation that God's Holy Spirit would work in us to change the things we want. And we depend on Him to do that. I think in this passage, we need to engage our intellect a little more heavily than we often do. Not that we should ever just enter a message on cruise control, but definitely today we need to really be thinking about the words we read, what they mean, and how it applies to our culture today. So please focus with me, dig in, have your Bible open and your eyes open, and pay attention and see where it leads us. Verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. This should be, I hope for many of us, an awkward transition. Paul's had a pretty consistent attitude, message, heartbeat in 1 Corinthians, and this isn't it. He's been correcting and correcting and correcting and pointing out error and asking for change over and over again. And suddenly, here we go, chapter 11, verse 2, I praise you, I commend you, brothers, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So in their practices, in the ordinances of the church, they are remembering the teaching of the apostle, and he commends them for that. You're doing great. Thanks. Keep it up. That stands out from the rest of what we've been reading in 1 Corinthians. And so it also is an opportunity for us to make a point of application, not from what's being taught here, but from the example of Paul's life and ministry. And that is that we should affirm the good even when it is surrounded by bad. Affirm the good even when it is surrounded by bad. And I want to spend just a minute to go a little deeper there. I have this temptation, and I think many other people might have the same, where I struggle with my kids and with other people who I'm in a relationship with to praise them when there's a lot of things that are a challenge either in the relationship or in their behavior. Right? So you have a coworker or employee who's consistently having problems. There's a reluctance to offer too much praise because you don't want them to get the wrong idea that they're doing a great job when they're not. And so for me, oftentimes that results in me keeping my mouth shut when I shouldn't. When they do something great, we need to call that out. We need to offer praise for the good things, even if everything else looks rough. People need that. I read a book about marriage not too long ago, and it talked about the need for a spouse to fill their spouse's emotional tank. And the illustration they use is that of a little kid. Right? So picture little boy going with his mommy to the grocery store. Right? We're talking like toddler age. So he's felt loved and supported and protected at home, so he, he has a little comfort to, to move out a little bit at the store, maybe check out the candy bars, but never gets more than maybe five or ten feet away from mom. And then a stranger comes up to the little boy and says, Hi, how are you doing? What is the little boy's reaction often? Run and bury the face in mom's legs. Right? I don't want to interact with you, Mr. Strange Person. I need to go to my safe place, to the person who I know loves me and cares for me and is going to keep me safe. We pretend as adults that we don't need that anymore. But the reality is we've just expanded our comfort zone so we can appear normal to the people around us. There needs to be someone in our lives who loves us, who calls out what God is doing in our lives in a positive way, because all of us go out into the world and get beat up and beat up and beat up, and we need to come home and know that there's someone who God is using to speak his love and truth into our lives. And I especially have seen this with my kids. If you've ever done this as a dad, I think you can resonate with me on what's going on here. A kid who's having a rough day. They come home, and dad says, I'm proud of you with a legitimate word of praise for something they're doing that makes you proud as a dad. Have you seen your kid's face when you do that, moms and dads? Whatever else was wrong gets better, and their faces turn up and brighten up. And you can do the same thing for your spouse, for your coworkers, for whoever it is that you're coming into contact with on a regular basis. You can change their day by doing what Paul did here, which is extending praise, even if there's a lot of things going on that are not praiseworthy. So that's the first and the easiest thing that I think we're going to pull out of this entire passage. Affirm the good even when it is surrounded by bad. And it doesn't take long for Paul to go back to the, to the challenges. Look at verse 3. But... 
right? So remember, when there's praise followed by a but, that's an indication of where we're headed. But I want you to know that the head of every Christ is mi- of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So you're doing some stuff, all right? I'm proud of you. This is going well, but you seem to have the entire order of authority in human creation confused. So I want you to know the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And so this is a principle that's going to carry through the rest of this passage. And the principle is that God has ordained a structure for authority among human beings. God ordained an authority structure for humanity. God ordained an authority structure for humanity. Not popular in our culture, but the Bible says this over and over and over again. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. And what does that look like in practice? You can see that each person who's put in this head role in this sentence in verse 3 is someone who has accountability to God for the person or people they're serving. Right? It says the head of every man is Christ. How did Jesus Christ demonstrate his headship over us? By laying down his life to redeem us to God. How are men called to illustrate their headship over women? In Ephesians chapter 5. By doing the same thing that Christ did for his church. Laying down his life for his bride. And how did Christ willingly demonstrate submission to God. Philippians chapter 2. He gave up everything that he had in heaven and came and suffered and died on a cross so that we could have relationship with him. So each of these are rules where we see the authority being invested by God in one for the benefit of others. God ordained an authority structure for humanity. Now we're going to take that principle and apply it in the context of Corinth. And things are going to get a little challenging. So look at verses 4 through 6 with me. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered... Let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. Okay, I hope, if you're at all remotely paying attention, a whole bunch of questions just popped up as we read that. And I want to go through a a few of them with you. So the the first one, which is referred to several times, is the, the dishonor of the head, right? First it says, if the man's praying and he he has his head covered, that dishonors his head. If the woman's praying and she doesn't have it covered, that dishonors her head. Is the head talking about her physical head, or is it the head we just read about in verse 3? So in the case of the woman, would she be dishonoring the man, her husband? In the case of the man praying with his head covered, would he be dishonoring his own head, or would he be dishonoring God? It says Christ is the head of every man. So who's being dishonored by whatever it is we're doing with our heads? That's an important question that I hope we can answer. Also, what is the covering? Right? Are we talking about women who come to church should have a box on their head before we pray? Should they wear a hat? What are we talking about? All kinds of questions that we're dealing with. And so I read a lot of pages <laughs> on these topics, and there is nothing that we can be dogmatic about in the whole thing. As we apply this principle, I don't think that any of these questions are answered in a way that we should have this is a rule at the church. There should be a sign at the back of the church that says, all women put a box on your head before you come in the door. You can tell we don't believe that because there's no sign on the back, right? But I want to talk about historically how this has worked itself out in in the church. And even today, you can see evidence of this. If you go to a Mennonite or an Amish or a Hutterite fellowship, you will see the women still have the little things on their heads, right? So there is definitely a pretty broad consensus that it was something on their heads, like a hat or a veil or a kerchief, something on top of the lady's head. And that I think for many of you begs the question, why? Why does a lady's head need to look different from a man's head? 
The more questions we ask, I think the closer we get to the principles of what's being taught here. So again, remember the, the big principle is God has ordained an authority structure for humanity. And the application of that principle in Corinth is that the ladies need to cover their heads in some way. So we need to know a little bit about what was going on in Corinth that this even becomes an issue. And so what was happening is ladies were going and praying and prophesying in, in some public form. We don't necessarily know that it was the context of the local church worship service like we're in today. But in some body of other believers, they were praying and prophesying with their hair down and their heads uncovered. Culturally, why was that a problem? So in all of the key cultures represented in Corinth, in the Jewish, Greek, and Roman cultures, women kept their hair up in a thing like a bun. And some of them had a cover from the Jewish culture. But women who didn't do that were considered to be behaving as either adulteresses or prostitutes. So what he's really saying is if you're, you're going to minister in front of other people, you shouldn't look like a prostitute. There's also another point, and it has to do with gender distinction. So he talks about this whole shave or shorn thing, which would be to just clip your hair really close as a woman. So a woman with, with hair like mine. And that was a punishment in all the cultures that would happen to ladies who committed adultery. You can even read about it in the Bible in Numbers. It, it's right there in our Bible in the book of Numbers. So a woman who had her hair shorn was widely regarded as disgraced by all the cultures that were in this melting pot that we're reading about in Corinth. And so uh, that was another thing that, that a woman shouldn't be doing. So the point was that in the way she looks, she is reflecting God's design for the authority structure that he's built. And the same is true of the man. A man who would have had long hair or had the cover like the woman, whatever that cover was, was looking effeminate. And so there was the importance of gender distinction that was being broken if a man were to look like a woman or a woman were to look like a man. So there's sexual purity, there's respect for the authority, and there's this gender distinction, all of which Paul's trying to protect in three very difficult verses. So in the way we dress, we can still apply this now, is there gender distinction? Is there respect for the authority figures in our lives. And so as a man, we need to dress in a way that communicates our allegiance to Christ's headship over our lives. I'm not dressing to entice other women when I come to church. I'm not dressing to demonstrate me or my body. I'm dressing to reflect the glory of God. And as a woman, the same thing applies. I'm not dressing to attract other men. I'm not dressing to get eyeballs on me. I'm dressing to reflect the glory of God. And it's still possible now to, to look like an adulteress or to look like a prostitute. And these are things that we're called to avoid. It's still possible as a woman to look like a man. It's still possible as a man to look like a woman. All these are things we're called to avoid. Our conduct, attitudes, and even our clothing choices should demonstrate our reverence for God's design. Our conduct, attitudes, and even clothing choices should demonstrate our reverence for God's design. And that applies to gender distinction, the respect for authority, and sexual purity. All three of those areas are important in the way we dress and the way we behave ourselves. Verse 7. For a, woman, a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. I hope again there's a whole bunch of questions going through your minds as we read that. Okay, so we've covered the principle which is that God has this ordained authority structure for humanity. We've covered at least the local application in Corinth, and we've broadened that out so we can understand it in our context, which is that our conduct, attitudes, and even our clothing choices should demonstrate our reverence for God's design. Now he's telling us why. Why the head coverings in Corinth mattered. 
and it, it's not unfortunately super clear, so let's dig into it. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. So there's something about a man covering his head, and, and we're still, again, the covering could be long hair, it could be a hat, it could be the kerchief kind of thing, or even a veil. And for us, that sounds ridiculous. A man wearing a veil, that never happens, right? But in Jewish culture, it did. When they dealt with the word of God, they did veil their faces. And so what he's saying is that we don't do that anymore. In Christ, don't do that, men, because you are the image and glory of God. The next half of that sentence is very difficult. But woman is the glory of man. Is that to say that women are not created in the image of God? This is seriously discussed in commentaries. It's an important question. Are women created in the image of God, or does it only apply to men? Look at Genesis 1.27. Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I take that to mean, and most conservative Bible scholars take that to mean, that men and women are created in the image of God. Our maleness and our femaleness are still in the image of God. And so, whether you're a man or a woman, you're created in the image of God. And notice in Paul's verse here in verse 7, he doesn't explicitly say woman's not created in the image of God, but he only says woman is the glory of man. And so the challenge here is what does that mean, that woman is the glory of man? And I think the best way for us to tackle it, again, this is not something that I think we can be dogmatic about, not something that we have strict guidelines on or rules to follow, but something to help us understand, is to look at the, the famous John Piper saying, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Right? And if we apply that to this context where it says Christ is the head of every man, we see that Jesus Christ is glorified in us as humans when we are satisfied in him. Do you agree? When, when we are acknowledging that I get everything I need from Jesus, we're showing the world that Jesus is great. I don't need money or cars or houses to be satisfied because Jesus is everything I need. Jesus provides for my needs in such a way that I don't need anything else. In the same way, a good husband provides for the need of his wife. And a culture, a community can tell a lot about a husband by the status of his wife. And so if a woman is well loved, well taken care of, that is an honor, that is glory to her husband. I really don't think Paul's saying much beyond that in this verse. And the people who take it way in different directions, I think they're wrong. But I'm not willing to be dogmatic because I have very little confidence in that. Right? I've read a lot of pages, and the most important thing I did in this is comparing it with the rest of Scripture. And over and over again, I see women called to glorify God. Over and over again, we see things like we just read in Genesis 127, that male and female were created in the image of God. So what I think it's talking about is in a man serving his wife as he's called to, he is given glory, he is given honor for being a good husband. Just as Christ is given honor as being a good Savior, when the world looks at us and sees that we don't need the same garbage to be happy that they need. We don't need sexual relationships outside of marriage. We don't need money. We don't need all these things. Jesus is enough. And if your husband is taking care of you the way he's called to in Scripture, then it will be apparent to the world around you that your husband is a good husband, that he's providing for your needs. So I really think that that's all that's going on there at the end of verse 7. Verse 8. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. This whole thing comes from the Genesis creation account. And, and there are two big important distinctions there. That woman was created from man and for man. Okay, Women were created from men and, and for man. And I recognize that's completely out of step with our culture. I don't care. That's what the Bible says, and it's real. And you can pretend as hard as you want that it's not real, but it is. Woman was created from man and for man. 
God looked at this man that he created, said it's not good for him to be alone, and he made a help meet suitable for him. So in the mission that God created man for, to glorify him and enjoy him forever, he said men need help in that mission. They can't do this by themselves. And he gave us women. So we have different roles. God created us for different purposes. They all contribute to the big, broader purpose, which every single one of us is here to glorify God. But as a distinct man and as a distinct woman, we have different roles to pursue in the ultimate goal of glorifying God. So his reasons are this creation order that woman was created from man and for man. And the end of verse 10, because of the angels. Now, just imagine you're having a conversation with a friend and the friend says, look, I want you to do this, right? I don't want you to go to work on Tuesday. Why don't you want me to go to work on Tuesday? Because of the angels. How are you going to react to that? I'm going to have a tough time. Are you saying the angels told you this? Because of the angels, in any context in our culture, is not a very good argument, right? But he's putting it at the end of this chunk of his argument of reasons why women should be wearing whatever this head covering is. So it's significant. It's important. Why, because of the angels, should women wear a head covering? Again, we can't be dogmatic about any of this, but I think there are some good, important clues. The, the first big important clue is that men and women are given authority over angels. Do you remember that Bible tells us that someday we will judge them? So in the, the big pecking order of God's created design, women are going to come above angels at the end times. That's crazy to think about, right? Another is that angels are present in Christian worship. That's a crazy thing to talk about. In Ephesians, it talks about them learning from the church's worship, that they, they want to know more about the mystery of the gospel that, that we've experienced in a way they can't. That's amazing to me. And I, I thought about this as we were singing this morning. We sang Days of Elijah. Remember that song, There's No God Like Jehovah? There's a kind of viral video that some of you may have seen of a bunch of army guys, and they're like filling up this school-sized gymnasium, and they're all singing this song, There's No God Like Jehovah. Has anyone seen that? It's really cool. There's this strong, deep male voice, and they're all worshiping God together in their army clothes, right? And if you're patriotic and you're excited about people loving God, maybe you get a little goosebumps and you watch the video, you share it with your friends, everybody's excited. It's cool to me that all these voices are on the same team, right? And what we can't see, and we just have to trust from God's word, is that when we're in here and we're singing those songs of praise to God, there's not just army guys on the other side of the world singing with us. There are angels in here with us praising the same God. Those angels who are in here with us praising God were there when he created the world. They were there when he established this divine authority structure that men were above women. And they are charged with protecting God's worship. You can read about it in Isaiah, where the angels themselves, certain angels, cover their faces as they worship God. And so if God said, this is the authority structure, and this is the way we're going to reveal that authority structure, it's offensive to angels who are worshiping with you if you aren't honoring God's structure of authority. So if you as a woman are trying to take the role of the man in the church, it's offensive to the angels. Does that make sense? It's not crystal clear, and it's not something that I think we make rules about, but that's what Paul seems to be saying to me. The other reasons that people give for this mention of the angels are way out in left field, and I don't even want to mention them because I think they're that crazy. But I do believe from Scripture that angels are learning from the church. Angels can see everything God did. They were there, but they can't experience the redemption that you and I experience from our sin in Jesus Christ. And it's amazing to them that this holy God that they've worshipped from eternity past, from whenever they were created, is willing to give up what they've experienced with him in heaven to come down and put on a, a little weak, frail body like ours and then suffer and die so that weak, frail, sinful people like us can have a relationship with him. And they look into that and they want to understand it in a way they can't. The Bible tells us that. They long to look into what you and I experience in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And so there's this whole other part of creation that we can't even see or experience yet. And, and they're part of this. God's divine order is bigger than you and I. And I think that's a big part of what Paul's going for here. Man is not from woman, and woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. The other thing that that points out to us is that there was gender distinction way before 1950, when all this stuff became a big issue, right? Before feminism became the, the force that it is in our culture, there was already clearly established gender distinction way back at creation. So there is evidence for gender distinction from the beginning. There is evidence for gender distinction from the beginning. And this is really, really important. Um, when I'm reading a difficult passage like this that I'm getting ready to preach on, I look for pastors I respect who've taught on the same passage. Right? That, that gives me insight to help me understand what does this mean? And how do we apply it in our context living in America today? I know that most of my colleagues and people that I interact with on a normal basis want nothing to do with the ideas that I'm proclaiming from this pulpit today. And so I, you know, I'm looking, who else has wrestled with these? What is, what is the truth out there? And the disappointing thing for me on this one was looking at all the guys I really respect as pastors, most of them either did not preach on this topic or for one reason or another their church chose not to publish those sermons. So I can't read them. But I found one, one of the guys I really respect, preached on this in 1993, which is the year I graduated from high school, almost 25 years ago. And he was, as he dealt with this whole idea of gender distinction, he just was grieving, almost to the point that you could hear tears in his voice as he was talking about the consequences, the blurring of the lines of the genders were going to have. In his generation, 25 years ago, he was talking about this incredible concern for the coming generation. And it's worse than what he pictured as he was preaching that sermon. What's taken place in the last 25 years is well beyond the things that he was concerned about in his message. And I just want to point out some realities. This is not from the Bible. This is from science and studies and things that I researched. Men and women are different. And I understand kids especially, you are growing up in a culture that tries to pretend we're not. But men and women are different. It's brutally apparent if you just open your eyes and look around. But I want to give you some more evidence that goes beyond what we can obviously see as far as differences between men and women because I think people are intentionally blurring those lines. There are men who are trying to look like women and women who are trying to look like men. And Paul says, hey, that's not fitting for worship. But I'm saying it is dangerous for your culture. Independent of what's going on in the church buildings, it destroys the culture that practices it. So here are some differences that I want to point out. And you may not like these, but they're real. Okay, the first, this is on average. If we rank and sort men and women and put them with like for like, the woman will be 52% as strong as the man in her upper body. So if I can bench press 200 pounds, the woman who is matched with me will bench press 104 pounds. Do you understand how significant of a difference? You're barely half as strong. A woman is barely half as strong in her upper body as a man. I think most of you have experienced enough in life to say that's roughly true, right? We can see... Right? I don't go to my wife when I can't open the pickle jar. It just, that's not how the world works. We can pretend, but it's not how it works. For the lower body, women are about 64% as strong. So if I can move 400 pounds with my legs, the woman who's matched with me will be able to do 256. It's, again, a huge, significant difference. Another important one is hematocrit levels. That's the red blood cell packing ability to transport oxygen and stuff inside your body. The reference values for men are 12% higher than the reference values for women. The reference values are when you get a blood test and it says you're normal, low, or high, that, that range. And for men, it's 12% higher. So men can transport oxygen 12% at least more efficiently than women. We're just designed differently. Size. In 2010, the average woman in America was five foot four and 166 pounds. The average man was five foot nine and 196 pounds. So five inches taller, 30 pounds heavier, just on average. Here's one that I know is not going to be popular. IQ. From age 15 on, men consistently have a higher average IQ, and 
the higher the IQ, the more likely you're a man. I know no one wants to hear that, but it's true. The male brain is 8% larger than the female brain, and there are 15% more neurons in a male brain than an average female brain. But, in case the guys are starting to get cocky, listen to this. There was a college program that did a study. One-third of the students were men, but two-thirds of late assignments were handed in by men. What does that tell you guys? Maybe we aren't as focused as we ought to be. Women live 8 to 10% longer on average than men. Now, recently, The Atlantic, are you familiar? This is a pretty well-known magazine, not known for defending the Christian faith. But they did this article on female athletic performance catching up to that of men. Because they expected, as time has gone on, and we're eliminating all the barriers and all that stuff, that female athletic performance would begin to gain on that of men. What do you think they found? They were wrong. If you look across cardiovascular related sports, so this is like track and field, running, rowing, bicycling, all those things, regardless of what sport you pick, the female world record is about 88 to 90 percent that of the men. They're just performing about the same rate of hematocrit difference that they have with men. They're performing at the level they were designed to perform. And no matter what steroids and all that stuff that people use, the differences remain across ages, across categories. Men move faster for a longer period of time than women. That whole difference is changed dramatically for weightlifting related competitions though. It's less than a third. There's a huge difference. The world record for men weightlifters are much bigger than those for female weightlifters. We are different. And our world is trying desperately to pretend these differences don't exist. Even in my preparation for this sermon, I was alarmed by the lengths people go to to hide these facts in their articles. If you look at the Wikipedia entry right now for male and female phenotype, that's expression of who we are through what we do, they have obscured all the differences that I just mentioned, and they're only footnoted as you know, other articles you can go read. And it tries to minimize all the differences. And I do think... There are some healthy motives in some of that stuff, right? There, there is some desire to avoid the oppression of women, and that's a good thing. And we're going to see Paul stood up for women very soon in a way that prohibits that kind of behavior. But it's wrong to pretend that men and women are the same. We are not the same. We were created for different purposes with different bodies to do different things. Verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things come, all things are from God. We depend on one another. So if you're a man and you listen to all the differences and you got cocky and thought, look how awesome I am, you're wrong. You would not exist without women. That's painfully apparent, right? There's no men without women. But at the same time, he says, there's no women without men. We are codependent. And we were created that way by God. Look at the last part of verse 12. As woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Men don't come from women because women are better than men. Women don't come from men because men are better than women. We are dependent on each other because God made us to be dependent on each other. Nothing we've read should give you the impression that men are better than women or women are better than men. It should give you the impression that we are different, that God has given us different roles to perform. Women and men are mutually dependent by God's design. His is the ultimate authority in this whole thing. This was not written to make women a second-class type of citizen or to prop up men, but to illustrate God's design in our different roles. And then he's going to conclude this section with some more reasons. And it, when he gets into these reasons, it's going to be confusing again. Verse 13. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. 
But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Okay. So a woman praying with her head uncovered, he says, is obviously dishonoring her. Okay. And this is where the whole discussion about what the covering is kind of comes to a head. Verse 15. Her long hair is given to her for a covering. So some people interpret that to mean that this whole discussion has been about long hair. That a woman having long hair is doing what she's supposed to be doing. And the, the only kind of admonition is that it not be hanging down like the prostitutes of that day would have done. So the point being there that if you're praying in this public form, it's not to attract the attention of men. You're not running a commercial. You're here to honor God. And so whatever that is that was viewed as the commercial needs to be obscured, which they could do by putting their hair up in a bun. And there are many church cultures, even now, around the world, that still do the same thing, where the woman will wear her hair in a bun. My grandmother wore her hair in a bun until she was very old, and I suspect this is why. I never talked to her about it, but I suspect that this is why she did it. If you go to any Mennonite church, all the women will do that and have a little covering in addition to that because they feel that this is what God's calling them to do based on this passage. Okay? So I think that's not a good argument. I don't think it's just the hair. And the reason is at the beginning when he talks about the men needing to not have a cover. Does that mean that all the men should have bald heads? I don't think that's true. I also think it's, it's not true that we should be driving to have women put something on their heads because it just doesn't make sense to take that application to a church in Corinth with the whole prostitution angle that we talked about and apply it to our context where it doesn't mean that at all. No one here is going to think you're a prostitute for not wearing a hat. So it's not a reasonable application, but the principle and the contextualization into our world still matter. We should be evidencing gender distinctiveness. We should be evidencing submission to the authority figures God has placed in our lives, whatever those are. And so I, I don't think it's just the hair, nor do I think that we should be viewing this as a template that everybody needs to have covering on their heads if they're female. He says it's a dishonor for the man to have long hair. And it's an honor for the woman to have long hair. That used to be true in America. Do you agree? And some of us still live that way, not necessarily because we think the Bible is telling us that, but because it's part of our conforming to the norms around which we live. Right? My hair is pretty short, and I, I never let it get very long. Sabrina's hair is usually long, and she never shaves it like mine. The only application of all that that I think still is something we need to do in our lives today is make sure that I'm reflecting the gender God created me to be. So if I'm a man, it doesn't mean my hair needs to be as short as it is now, but people looking at me should know that I'm a man. If I'm a woman, my hair doesn't have to be down to my waist, but people should be able to tell that I'm a woman. And I shouldn't be dressing in a way, whether male or female, that advertises me as a product, like the prostitutes in Corinth. So we're here to glorify God, not to market ourselves. And that's something that applies to you regardless of your gender. But verse 16, and we'll wrap it up. I know we're a little late here. There's a big point here that I want us to be able to take home. If anyone seems to be contentious, that's arguing about this particular issue, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So you guys in Corinth, if you're going to go ahead with your new custom of, of having the women do what it is they're doing with this hair down or uncovered kind of prophesying and praying, you are out of step with all the apostles and all the rest of the church of God. He's making it really clear. If someone's arguing with you about this, we don't have a custom like that. We, the apostles, nor do the churches of God. The other churches that we started as the apostles aren't doing this. You're doing something different. And so here's something that I think directly applies to our lives. If you desire a change from the tradition of the apostles and the early church... Be exceptionally careful about your motives, understanding, and discipleship. And I, I chose those words because I think this whole thing has been about as clear as mud. Even after hours and hours to get into it, there's a lot that's not clear. But what is clear is these three things that we should be evaluating in ourselves if we're proposing a change to the church. The church in our culture is changing rapidly. There are people who have been evangelical Christians who are on Twitter and Facebook, who are embracing things like homosexual marriage, 
transgenderism, all these things that I think are clearly spoken against in this passage and certainly the rest of the Bible. And so Paul's word to them there in verse 16 is, look, if you want to change this stuff, you better be 100% sure you're right because nobody else is doing it. None of the apostles did it, none of the early church did it. So first it says motives. Be careful about your motives. Why is it that you want to change the behavior of the church? Is it really because you're seeking to honor God or you want to be more comfortable with your unsaved friends across the street? Your understanding. Do you understand the tr tradition that you're trying to change? Because I don't think any of us, myself included, can look at this passage and say, I have a solid understanding of what they were doing and why they were doing it. Because I don't. I, the parts I understand are the parts I made clear, clear here, which are gender distinctiveness, submission to authority, and sexual purity. And that clarity doesn't come from this passage. It comes from the rest of the Bible. Those are things that God makes apparent over and over and over again. So our motives, our understanding. Do I understand this thing that I'm seeking to change in my church? If I don't, I probably shouldn't try to change it. And finally, discipleship. Am I doing this thing so that I can grow as a disciple and I can equip other disciples? Or am I doing this thing because it's popular and comfortable and it feels good for now? So if you think something needs to change from the tradition given to us by the apostles in the early church, be exceptionally careful regarding your motives, understanding, and your discipleship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that you've given us together this morning. I ask that you would, by your spirit, work in ways that I could not work with this text, that you would make it clear to us. Help us to be in a world full of confusion, people who bring clarity in terms of who we are in our gender roles, in terms of who we are in seeking to glorify you, and in terms of who we are in seeking to obey you with our human sexuality. We want to be pure. We want to please you. We want to submit to the authorities that you've brought into our lives. And we want to honor your creative intent in our genders. So if we're men, help us to look, behave, act, think like men. If we're women, help us to look and act like women. Thank you for the time you've given us together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.